the dreaded C word, cancer. But is it as much of a death sentence as it used to be? Have we made enough advancements in both traditional cancer care and alternative treatments to make survival less miraculous? We are hitting this hot topic head on today on Healthy Harmony. Welcome to Healthy Harmony, where we help you clarify and discuss health tactics to harmonize your life. I am your host and health coach, Jennifer Pickett, and today my guest is cancer navigator and advocate, Tina Withrow. Tina is a certified cancer navigator and a patient advocate. She is president and CEO of HealthSync. HealthSync works with employer groups and individuals to break down the barriers to care in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Um, Prior to HealthSync, Tina was the Director of Patient Services at Texas Hematology Oncology for 11 years. And most recently, she was the recipient of the Caring Spirit Award given by the American Cancer Society um, and also was chosen as Caregiver of the Year by the National Breast Cancer Foundation. On a personal note, Tina is my dear friend, and we have worked in oncology together for years and years. So, Tina, it is an honor to have you on this show today. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you so much. And oh, my gosh, such accolades. Thank you. Well, I had to include everything, um, and I wanted to give our listeners just a really good picture of um, your background and your experience. Your life has truly um, has truly been um, uh, invested in this uh, cancer community. So um, I want to get right into our hot topic today. Um, obviously, we're going to be talking about cancer. So let me ask you, what in the world is going on? It seems like there's so many diagnoses that are happening. Um, and is, is cancer on the rise? Well, um, I don't think that cancer is on the rise. It may feel like that. Um, the numbers really show that cancer is on decline, um, hmm. cancer deaths, but we're, we're diagnosing cancer much earlier because there's great testing going on and through screenings and people being aware and the internet and all of that, people really are very plugged into their um, their cancer uh, diagnosis and what they can do to prevent cancer. Now, not everybody does that, but we're, we're making some headway there. You know, we're reducing smoking and all of those things. So people are getting checked. We have some um, things in place now. We we do screening, uh, CT screening now for people who smoke, and that's catching those cancers early. Um, okay. So that does make those numbers rise and feel like everybody's getting cancer. Yeah, it does. It feels like everywhere we look that people are being diagnosed. And so you're saying, are you saying that it's more a result of increased screenings? Well, I, I think there's a lot that goes into that number feeling like it's rising. Remember that our population is aging. And as we age, the number one risk factor, um, there are two risk factors really, but you know, age is one of the number one risk factors for cancer. Diet, lifestyle, nutrition, that's another. Uh, but really the population's aging. That's why we're seeing the increase in the Alzheimer's. So um, the the rise in that is is can really be tied to age. I would I would definitely agree with that. Now you have worked in oncology for years and and years. Um, and this is a dip, this is a really tough area to work in. I'm curious, what is your what's your personal story? Why are you so passionate about helping others with cancer? Well, um, I'm the baby of seven children, and my mother, my father, and five of my siblings have all had cancer, and my mother, father, four siblings have died of cancer. So when my sister, who was my mother figure, my mother died when I was 11, she had cancer most of my life. So my sister, who I was so close to, when she was diagnosed with cancer, I became very involved in the American Cancer Society. And um, started Relay for Life, really got really plugged in, and then was fortunate enough um, to be asked by a group of physicians uh, to help them run a cancer program 
here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And then about eight years ago, I became disillusioned with healthcare and decided I wanted to start a company um, that would that would really help people. So cancer has really affected my life. It's a very personal, um, terrifying time in someone's life. And it can, it can rob you of a lot, emotional, spiritual, financial. And um, I've just vowed to make it my life's work much as you have in what you do. When you um, see loved ones that are really affected by lifestyle, uh, by the healthcare system, you can either become a victim to it or you can dig in and make changes. And uh, you and I've really spent a good part of our life in the Dallas-Fort Worth area trying to make that change. And we've been successful in a lot of areas. I think we have definitely been successful in a lot of areas. Um, uh, looking back at your at your career in oncology, um, uh, Relay for Life uh, with um, American Cancer Society, that was one of my kind of first introductions with American Cancer Society as well, many, many years ago in Jackson, Mississippi. And I just, I really do love that, that fundraiser with the American Cancer Society. Um, so you and I have um, have done uh, numerous things together on the on the patient side and really helping to offer those support services. You and I did that um, that cancer support group for five years, uh, really empowering individuals, and it was so much more than just people sitting around and sharing their feelings. But we brought in experts every single month uh, to hit on a hot topic and to really empower these individuals that were going through a very difficult diagnosis. So I wanted to give people kind of that background because that is one uh, excellent way of empowering others. You alluded to something in your your personal story um, and in your career. You said that you've become very disillusioned with healthcare. So I would love for us to unpack that a little bit. Um, Tell me where that... how did that disillusionment start happening, and um, and what are you seeing in healthcare that is very disappointing to you? So I became disillusioned when I really began to see that we were treating the healthcare groups and physician and hospital practices were were treating uh, patients, um, and not really getting into the emotional side of it. And and it became a money thing, not in every case, not everything is, you know, you have good physicians and you have okay physicians. I think, I think uh, every physician starts out thinking that they're really going to change the world. The system kind of has beat them down, but as money, as dollars have gotten squeezed from Medicare and insurance carriers, we've all had to, reassess our financial um, well-being from the downturn of the economy. And I, and I know we're in a robust society, you know, economy right now, uh, but you can't talk to anybody now that doesn't have a high deductible and a pretty big out of pocket. And as You're those so dollars right. have gotten squeezed to physicians, what I find is, is there's in, in oncology and other areas, there is less one-on-one time with the physician or with the nurse and people have less time knowing what is going on with their cancer or with their health. And they don't know how to uh, gather the true information and how to separate fact from fiction. And it isn't like you can leave a message for your doctor or leave a message for your nurse and get a call back Uh, very quickly in a lot of instances. If you can find that jewel of a practice, um, that's why we're seeing an increase in the functional medicine side. Jennifer, you and I have talked many times. That's why there's such a need for what you do because people don't know what they don't know. They get a cancer diagnosis and they don't know. And just going out on the internet, while it has great information, you really put all your trust in your medical team and it's very, very difficult to find a medical team that is really going to care for you. It's, well, um, it's so ch- it's so very challenging. Um, so, do you believe that our is our healthcare system simply driven by by money? 
I believe that the healthcare system 100% is, is driven by money. Okay. So what would you say to that person who, uh, the, the skeptic who says, no, we've made all of these advancements. Pay, uh, people are getting better care nowadays and it's not driven by money um, or it absolutely has to be driven by money. How would you respond to to that skeptic when we bring up this very tough subject of patient care and money? So one a great example is that is in nutrition. Um, every oncology patient, every, every newly diagnosed cancer survivor, every person who's completing their chemotherapy or their radiation treatment should be talking to a health coach, to a nutritionist. And you and I both know that insurance does not pay for that always. And yeah, if, yeah. They, if ever, if ever, if I ever, seen any cases where, uh, yeah, it would be uh, unusual and very far between um, for that to be covered. Um, uh, you know, Tina, it makes me go back to when um, I was a new, a newer dietitian and my husband got a job in uh, Texas. And so he said, Hey, what do you think of Texas? And I was like, I don't know. I've never been. And so my intention was, um, my intention was to uh, to move here and to be an oncology dietitian um, in a cancer center and to get involved in research. And what I very quickly discovered, and this is back in 2000, is that none of the cancer centers employ dietitians, even though this is an absolutely crucial component. And Tina, I'm so disappointed to say that nothing has changed. This is still a huge need for cancer patients to get support with that nutrition, and yet it's not happening. Why is this not happening? Why have we made absolutely no progress in this area? Well, number one, it is about the money. The physician does not get paid to do nutritional counseling, so therefore they're not going to recommend anything that doesn't benefit them. Yes, I know I'm being controversial about that. Uh, so that's number one. And number two, let's look on the benefit side. The employer group is not going to pay for anything under the, that basic plan. Um, yes, you have some that people that have flex benefits, and I'm, I'm grateful at least for flex benefits that yeah. people can use those dollars wisely. But nobody is giving a recommendation or very few are giving recommendations. I'm fortunate I work with a very small group. We have a large group of hospital systems in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We have lots of different hospital systems. And, and I've been around for a very long time. And I have lots of physicians that counsel with me daily on where can I send here? When, where can I send there? And it's really disappointing that very few call me and ask me about dietary right? Or nutrition, yeah. or I have yeah. somebody that's, that's not eating well, or I have someone that has lost 35 pounds and they're getting ready to start radiation. What do I do? When I worked at the cancer center, our nutritional guidelines, you and I spoke about this, uh, every physician, when the family would say, or the survivor would say, what do we need to do as far as nutrition? They would say, well, first you get a Big, big old bu bucket of Bluebell ice cream. Yes, shameless oh, plug for Bluebell. Yes, I but, am. I, I'm, I'm sitting here shaking in my boots. That that kind of nutrition advice just um, astonishes me. Um, and it brings up such another, like, huge controversial topic. First of all, um, uh, physicians are not encouraging their, uh, their patients to actually seek nutritional counseling. And I think part of the problem is that there's no one there to do that nutritional counseling. You don't have these trained professionals um, in the cancer centers, and it really all falls on the nurse. But uh, when I do hear of a, a cancer patient receiving uh, nutrition advice, it is very outdated nutrition advice. And it's very... Um, what I would call almost like just kind of half-hearted, like, oh, you're losing weight. Okay, well, go have a milkshake or here, drink this uh, this nutritional supplement, drink this nasty nutritional supplement in a can. Um, and that way you can put some weight on. It is, there's no, there's no thought to it. So um, 
So it brings up a very valid point. Uh, we talk about nutrition and um, empowering a patient so that they can take control and really address this absolutely crucial area and support the body in a very positive manner while they are going through treatment. Um, so I see uh, people getting very, very outdated advice. So Tina, I want to hear your opinion about something uh, because I think this is one of the most controversial topics in cancer care today when it comes to nutrition. Can sugar play a role in the growth of cancer cells? That's a really big question. It is. It is. Sugar Sugar plays a very important and key role in cancer prevention and cancer treatment and cancer recovery. But it isn't just as simple as not doing, taking in sugar or not eating a donut in the morning. You've got to really understand what that is, is all about. And I get angry at the medical establishment who tells cancer survivors who hang on every word, we have to think about this. We spend more time with the gentleman who is showing us and helping us pick our new car than we do with our oncologist who are putting our life in. Oh, holy cow. That's crazy. That think, is about, absolutely think about crazy. that, but that's true. I mean, yeah. for a physician to make money, they need to spend about 15 to 20 minutes with each patient um, if they're going to make money. Um, and Tina, that might be very generous, 15 to 20 minutes. Oh, it is. And most of the time, remember, they're staring at their computer and typing because they have to hit key points. Um, I would like to use this platform to just remind people, everybody asks me, why does my physician look at a computer and ask all of those questions every time I go to visit. Well, hmm. the physician gets hit um, monetarily if they don't tick all those boxes that they're asking you. So think about how that takes away from the authentic visit in addressing your questions about nutrition and well-being. It does. It takes away tremendously. And I recently was in an oncology office with a dear friend and uh, and had a doctor say to us, it is no longer about patient care. It's about the paperwork. And so I think we we, we see that. So kind of getting back to that, that that really big, huge subject of, of sugar and it driving the growth of cancer cells. Um, you know, I hear so many opposing views on this and I hear experts who say there is no research that points to the fact that sugar can cause cancer cells to grow. How would you respond to those skeptics who say, hey, the research just doesn't support that? Well, I can tell you, you know, I track every client, every client that comes through HealthSync. I started that when I was at the cancer center because I had a very, um, at the time, everybody thought he was a crazy, crazy, crazy guy. I thought he was a crazy guy too. And um, he came to us and he had pancreatic cancer and he was going to follow a diet that, that really restricted his sugar intake. He had pa stage four pancreatic cancer. That was before juicing. That was before all of that. Jennifer, I think I, I pointed his case out to you and asked you to kind of consult yeah. on this because I, I want, I'm all about the well-being of the, of the patient just like you are. So I was the seeing this man patient. going against standard um, procedure and I, I wanted the best for him and for his family because he, he wanted to be here. And um, he followed, um, a, he, he had, uh, seek the advice from a, from a very, what, you know, what he felt was really good, well-established nutritional program. It was not here in the United States. Um, and he was going to follow that. And so that, that is what kind of led me down this, wait a minute, this guy is doing well. He's doing well in his journey and he's living well with cancer. And so th that's, I would say to those physicians, it's just like functional medicine and complementary medicine. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find a doctor who's going to say that. And trust me when I say this, chemotherapists like to do chemotherapy. Radiation oncologists like to do radiation oncology. And surgeons like to cut. 
You're, I, I would agree. I would agree with that. Um, and I know that's a very, um, I know that's a that's a tough opinion, and that might be tough for people to hear. But that is uh, the way of the world. So as we dig kind of deeper into this this very hot topic of cancer care and traditional medicine versus complementary medicine, alternative medicine, functional medicine, um, when someone is first diagnosed and they know, okay, I, I want to do something a little bit different. Should I go this route of traditional medicine? They might be scared to get to receive traditional medicine, the chemotherapy, the radiation, the surgery, et cetera, because they don't want to get sick or maybe they don't want to lose their hair. Or they don't want to have, uh, they don't want to struggle at all. Um, and they might use, uh, they might choose a more natural approach right off the bat. But um, I want to hear what do you think is the danger in this, in foregoing a traditional approach and just choosing a more natural or holistic approach? Well, I think you have to be very careful. What I would want the, the public to know is that you can live well in both worlds, but you have to be, do your research. You like have to have a good that. live well in both worlds. I, I am not I am not here today and I know you are not here today to say, oh, this is a wake up call, Joe Public. I would like you to give up all standard protocols for your type of cancer and, you know, go do the snake oil, whatever. You know, no, what I'm saying is you can live in the world of functional medicine traditional medicine and it, but you better have a good nutrition plan. You better have, yeah. and that's, that's more than just the standard, you know, ice cream or the standard uh, protein drink and so on, because you have to have a game plan. You are going off to war. And if we send our troops to basic training before they go off to fight why would we not do that for ourselves, for our bodies? We can take a pause and gather information. And I will tell you that my clients who do better have a plan. And that plan yeah. inclu includes a team. And not just a single, a single person, right? And I love how you describe that that team approach, and uh, and and really using that battle analogy, Tina. That someone is they are facing probably the biggest battle of their life, and uh, what can we do to equip the body, support the body's own natural God given immunity, so that it fights? But also in this battle, I don't feel that we have gotten to the point where we can just walk away or step away from traditional medicine. We are dealing with a very ugly, a very nasty disease that is a smart, intelligent disease. And so of all times, uh, it's time to bring out the big guns. Uh, but I think sometimes people just kind of bring out the big guns with the, the chemotherapy, the radiation, et cetera, and they they hesitate, they hold back when it comes to empowering their own body to fight back and working with their immune system and uh, supporting that immune system so that it fights. Um, but it's, I think it's this, this huge uh, conundrum, this huge conflict of how does somebody navigate that if they are curious about um, how do they support their body from a nutrition standpoint? How can they boost their own uh, immune system. Um, what are some reliable, trusted resources that people can turn to? Because this is a very confusing world. It is full of con conflicting opinions and uh, full of a lot of passionate people who have um, very strong, strong opinions on this subject. Well, if let, let, let's just role play a little bit. You know, God forbid if I were di diagnosed with a tough cancer diagnosis, you know, the first place I'm going is calling you because I'm mm -hmm. saying, you know, Jennifer, you know, I have this cancer and I, I need to know, I need to know a battle plan. I first kind of want to backstep a little bit. I don't understand. I, I spoke 
a couple of weeks ago to um, a veterans group, a large veterans group, because my son and I run a program called the Veterans VIP Cancer Program, and we help veterans. And so I had a lot of veterans in the room. And the one thing I wanted to take away from them is, gentlemen, ladies, if I could tell you one thing as you get ready to battle cancer, I would want to tell you something. Spend a little bit of your money. And what does that mean? Spend a little bit of your money. And it's a mindset. You know, we pull out that insurance card and we present it and we don't think that we need to spend any other money than our copay. And I want everybody to understand that it isn't that expensive to get a nutritional plan. It isn't that expensive to have some supportive uh, different treatments, acupuncture, um, you know, massage therapy, um, you know, good quality uh, essential oils, an appointment with a functional medicine doctor. Yeah. yeah. And and I, I recommended some of the more difficult cases that that people have two oncologists. Why in the world would you have two oncologists? Well, you have the oncologist that you're going to and you have the oncologist that you've had one visit with. They know about your case. You're an established patient and about six months into it, you take all of your records to that second oncologist and you say, how do you think I'm doing? Insurance pays for that. And that's, what- a, that's an interesting concept. Concept. I can almost hear people gasp as you say that, Tina, you know, because I think our our trust the way, you know, it's it's a physician and we trust them, uh, especially depending on what generation you're in. We trust very, very easily. Um, uh, I think I could also hear people gasp as you said, hey, spend a little bit of money outside of your copay. Is there some other supportive care that you can give your body, but you're going to have to spend out of your own pocket? And I think when it comes to uh, spending money on things that benefit our health, that is still a new concept to us. But um, in a very different concept, because our, our way of thinking is, well, it, if it's any good, insurance should cover it. Well, and I don't want people to come away from this conversation thinking that all they have to do is go to a to a, a well-respected store and pick up an organic protein. Um, it, yes. It's more than that. If you it is. cancer, if cancer, if cancer isn't anything, it is a time for us to pause, to reevaluate lots of things. But I would want to remind everybody, don't just put all your eggs in the traditional healthcare basket, because you are starting on a journey that that you will be talking about and living with for the rest of your life. And a lot of times we have those lifestyle, um, a lot of times we have those lifestyle changes that we want to make when we have a cancer diagnosis. So why not do it right? And why not gather kind of what I always call the power? Um, What I find when I can have somebody that comes and meets with me and then I have them, um, you know, get with you and really get a plan, um, they get their power back. Yes, they still have to fight cancer. Yes, they, they, they still have to do treatment. But they're meeting with people and they're really getting their power back. They're learning how to get how to get good sleep. They're learning yeah, yeah. how to cook um, and do the things that they need to do. They're learning how to go to the grocery store. They're learning about their emotional well-being. They're learning about self-care. What we're talking about, Jennifer, is self-care. I could not agree more. I could not agree more. And you know what, Tina, that is the really the perfect way to to really sum this this uh, this show up. Um, I love how you put let's not put all of our eggs in that traditional healthcare basket. And I hope that people are walking away from this podcast feeling empowered. Maybe their eyes have been opened up just a little bit. We talked about a lot of controversial things today, and I appreciate you being so so very open, but just presenting this other this other side. And I want people to feel empowered that you are in control of your own health, that no matter what diagnosis you face, it is time to be your own best 
advocate. So Tina, thank you so very much for uh, being my guest today. I truly appreciate you. Um, and I, I want people to know where to find you. So please let everybody know where they can best find you. So you can go to the website, wwwhealth sync sync.net or you can call 214-546-2215. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Guys, thank you for joining us today. Please remember to follow us uh, on your platform of choice, Instagram or Facebook at Inspire Healthy Harmony. Uh, And also you can check us out on InspireHealthyHarmony.com. So thank you for joining us. Until we meet again, I hope you have a great day. Bye, y'all.